Good morning, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here for Edu, Edu on Air, starting with uh, one of our first speakers, Claire Amos, who is the Deputy Principal at uh, Hobsonville Point School in, near Auckland. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, introducing her because she is fabulous and will shine herself. Don't forget, if you do have some questions, jump onto the uh, questions below this feed, add them there, and I'll be uh, hosting those questions for you guys. If we don't manage to get all the questions answered, we will answer them uh, via text shortly, uh, just after the stream, I guess. So um, my name is Chris. I forgot to say that. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this presentation. Over to you, Claire. Yoda. Thank you, Chris. Hi there. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Chris said, I am Claire Amos, and I am lucky enough to be one of the DPs at Hobsonville Point Secondary School, where I am beaming um, from today. As well as being Deputy Principal here at Hobsonville Point, I'm also one of the council members on the Education Council for Aotearoa New Zealand. And um, when I'm not in the school and in the classroom, I am out there absolutely advocating and fighting for change in education. So that brings us um, to my presentation today. So um, just bear with me for a moment while I slip over to the slides and um, we shall get going. Okay, so as my slides here show you, today's presentation is going to be looking at Google Classrooms and in particular, how we can use Google Classrooms to ensure we are developing very important 21st century skills. And in particular, looking at how we can develop learner agency. I'm also gonna be sharing some of the tips and tricks that I am using um, to promote universal design for learning. So what I touch on here today is really only um, an introduction um, to universal design for learning, but hopefully you can get some ideas to take away for how you can begin using it within your Google Classroom environment. So to take you through the journey we're going to go on, I wanna start by telling you a little bit about the school that I'm at, Hobsonville Point Secondary School. We are a brand new modern learning environment school here in Auckland, New Zealand. I'm then going to take you through um, the development of our best practice e-learning guide and how we use student voice to direct how we can best use the tools in and beyond the classroom to support our learners. And that will then take me to a little bit on universal design for learning and how that can be integrated with your use of Google Classroom. And also talking about how we can use Google Classroom to promote best practice and how we can make learning visible. And ultimately what this all comes down to is learner agency and what we can do to support our young people to learn for themselves and to take real ownership and control of their own learning. So first of all, welcome to Hobsonville Point Secondary School. Hobsonville Point Secondary School is a brand new innovative learning environment state secondary school in Auckland, New Zealand. We opened up in 2014 as one of the senior leaders alongside my principal, Maury Abraham, and my two deputy principals I work with, Lee Valanoff and Di Cavallo. We started at the beginning of 2013 and had an incredible year where we could research and look at um, different models of educational practice. We traveled through Canada and looked at self-directed schools. We traveled um, through America and we visited the big picture um, learning school in America. We looked at some of the best practice in our own backyard down at Unlimited um, in Christchurch and across um, Auckland and the wider New Zealand area. And then what we did is we took the opportunity to design what we saw as best practice and best fit education for the 21st century. So we were looking at reimagining um, 21st century learning, but reimagining what high school could look like for our learners. So we opened in 2014 with year nine students. So the way new schools work here is that you have year on year. So it is now 2016, so we have year nine, 10 and 11. We're a co-educational state school. We will end up having around 1,000 students from year nine to 13 in a few years' time. So next year we get our year 12s. Year after that, 
we get our year 13s. So we had the joy of a clean slate. And um, so we made the most of that by designing what we saw as a curriculum that was absolutely fit for purpose. We spent the first part of the year focusing on things like de-schooling or unschooling. So trying to park our mental models of what a secondary school needed to look like and how it needed to be structured. So we did a lot of research. We worked with our incoming team members who joined us um, partway through the year of 2013 and the beginning of term three and the rest of the team in beginning of term four. And we designed a curriculum that falls into three parts. So um, we have learning hubs. These are vertical homerooms or form classes that students meet in every morning. But we like to think that we've invented the homeroom on steroids. So as well as having that check-in in the morning, we also have three 80-minute blocks throughout the week. And during this time, it's a time where we can focus on our learners developing their dispositional um, sort of skills. It's about focusing on learning to learn. It's about reflecting on their learning. And it's about developing a really powerful partnership with their learning coach. So the idea is, for the most part, students will stay with that learning coach for the five years that they're at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. Now, we're in startup phase, so we're adding new staff. So um, it'll take a while before those students do stay with their learning coaches for the five years. But the idea is that that learning coach becomes their important adult at school. It's the person who can work with them to design a learning path. Um, it's the person that can help them set um, personal goals and learning goals. It's a way um, for them to have someone who's making sure that they're both extending themselves and getting any of the extra learning support they need. And it's during that time that we look after the health or the well-being of our students as well. So that is where we deliver part of our health curriculum. So um, for instance, health education, sex education, that sort of thing occurs in that time. Um, and it's also where we very explicitly focus on learning to learn skills and learning how to manage themselves, um, but also so um, learning how to develop what we refer to as our Hobsonville habits. So focusing on, say, creativity and resilience and um, all of those sorts of things. The other part of our curriculum uh, learning projects, so two thirds of every Wednesday, our students are committed to being in large scale, long term projects. Um, we see that as a way of developing a we not me culture. So our juniors go into what we call big projects. So um, they tend to be projects that are um, looking out to the community. So students um, choose a project that takes their interest. Um, they participate in finding a solution to an issue or a problem in our wider community. They work with partners and businesses in the community to find very real solutions um, for issues that might exist or opportunities that present themselves. And we see that as an opportunity for our students to develop empathy and um, develop sense of ethics and understand that if we are going to be um, developing 21st century learners is about developing young people that care about things greater than themselves, that they're looking at ways that they can contribute to the community. Now these big projects turn into impact projects when they're in year 11, 12 and beyond. That may be more of an opportunity to pursue personal passions. It may also be an opportunity to start up a business, um, to dive much deeper into an issue or um, designing a product that they're interested in developing. And again, we see this as a real opportunity for our students to develop that learner agency and to develop um, a sense of responsibility about um, their place in their community uh, and the world that we live in. We then also have our learning modules. So in a sense, this is how we deliver um, what you might consider the subjects or the learning area parts of our curriculum. 
But we decided it wasn't good enough to just chop up our week into 25 segments and divide it up into single subjects um, and send our students off to maths and English and science and social science, etc. So we decided to design a curriculum that was more about integrating the learning and combining subjects to show the natural connections that exist between them. Um, so our students, year nine and 10, they work together um, in a um, a combined level module. They select a range of modules that are um, based around different contexts or themes. Um, and each of the, um, they do some foundation modules that are two subjects combined. So for instance, um, I've been teaching um, the revolution will not be televised. I'm an English teacher. I've been working with Mike who is the art teacher. Um, in that time, we've been looking at how um, protest art and literature has been created and doing close reading of that, um, the literature and the art. And then we've also got them to create the literature and art together. And then this last um, term, it has resulted in us actually working together to produce the school magazine with um, Mike looking after the art side of things and me looking after the English side of things. So we're looking to show the students how learning is connected, but we're also looking at finding ways that those connected subjects um, and modules can be put into a very real context. So for us, it was creating the school magazine. Um, for other learning areas, it might be um, researching very real issues or taking very real action. So our students take a combination of integrated modules that we um, refer to as our modules, and then they also have the opportunity to take spins, which are our special interest single modules. So our year nine students take three um, integrated modules and um, I have a couple of spins or special interest single subject modules. Our senior students, our year 11s, they take two integrated modules and um, have three spins and then in year 12 they're going to be taking one integrated module and um, three different single subjects. So it's a way for them to see how learning is connected um, but they also have an incredible amount of choice and can choose um, which modules they go into but they work with their learning coach to ensure that they are still getting curriculum coverage and um, they are doing what's best for them. So they're being extended, they're challenging themselves but they're also getting any support that they need as well. So these are the principles that underpin our learning and everything we do, um, particularly um, when we look at how we use technology at Hobson Ball Point Secondary School, we come back to these three principles for learning. And um, I absolutely um, believe that these have stood the test of time. We came up with these back in 2013 and we still keep using these three tenants to test everything we do. Um, you know, are we innovating through personalizing learning? Are we engaging through developing power, powerful partnerships? And are we inspiring through deep challenge and inquiry? So everything we do, every project we design, every module we design, um, we keep coming back um, to these three principles to guide us. So, um, as I said, uh, this led to us developing an e-learning practice guide. So, um, we were really clear about the fact from day one that we were going to be a one-to-one -one school and that we were going to be aiming to be pretty much paperless. And, and when I say paperless, that meant that our delivery of learning was going to be um, through online platforms. It didn't mean that we're shunning paper. We very much believe it's about using the mode that's appropriate for the, the learning that is happening. Um, but we did see that we had this incredible opportunity to start as we mean to go on. So our students all came in with a device, a laptop of some sort, and um, we decided that we would deliver every module um, would have an online platform and we would deliver in a certain way. And in the first year or so, we did this in any number of ways. We trialed a range of different platforms from Moodle um, to people using blogs, um, and then Google Classroom finally became available and we started using that. Um, but what I want to talk about before we go any further is that I absolutely stand by this quote that's on the screen. We need to rec recognize that technology is simply um, a way of amplifying the practice that we do already. So I love this concept of the law of um, amplification. You know, 
Technology and these online platforms are not going to provide any sort of um, digital educational cures. They're not suddenly going to make the learning more powerful, any more engaging, unless they are amplifying best practice. So um, as this quote states, it was, an, it was a, a, an article that was shared with me that was um, sort of stressing that we're all going to hell in a handbasket for all the technology was in the classroom. Um, and I, the funny thing is, I actually came away loving the article because I think it made us really challenge why we use technology. And I think we've got to make sure that it's never about the bells and the whistles. It's not about distraction and about, you know, a whole lot of jazz hands. It's got to be about amplifying what we know to be best practice. And that's why we developed our e-learning best practice guide. We spend a lot of time with professional learning um, at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. And um, we spend a lot of time talking about what the very best practice looks like, both online and offline. And we recognised that whilst we were all using online platforms, we were using them in pretty ad hoc ways. And so we decided that we needed to create our very own best practice guide and a set of expectations that absolutely every teacher was expected to adhere to. Um, so we gathered a whole lot of student voice about what they were seeing in their classes was working well, um, what was the best practice they were seeing, where was learning happening best, um, what did they want, what didn't they want. The first thing they came back with is they wanted Google Classrooms. At that stage, we had a range of platforms, um, but what was great is that, that um, they came back to us and said, no, we want all our teachers to use the same platform. And it's not about limiting the tools. Our teachers are still welcome to experiment and our students and our teachers alike are encouraged to use whatever tool is right for the job. But what the students asked for was a common um, sort of entrance into all of their modules. They wanted all of their modules to be um, sort of housed and homed in the same environment. And they very clearly told us that Google Classroom was the, um, the platform they wanted. You know, I initially questioned Google Classroom. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I've been used to Moodle. Google's so simplistic, but actually, that's where the power lies. It is simplistic, um, but, and it's very clear for the learners, and it um, can be a very powerful tool for making learning incredibly visible. So this is what we developed, and as you can see, it comes back to um, those three tenets, innovate through personalised learning, engage through powerful partnerships, and inspire through deep challenge and inquiry. So we set up a set of expectations um, that our students teachers must adhere to and at this point I want to do a shout out to our fabulous um, e-learning specialist classroom teacher Danielle Myberg that led a lot of the work um, on creating this document with our students and our staff. So as you can see if we're going to innovate through personalising learning we're going to have to make sure we offer multiple modes it's got to be easy to navigate. They've got to be able to find um, what to do if they miss a class. And they need to be given choice. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we're using these platforms in a way that we're encouraging collaboration, that we're using it to connect to parents and whanau, um, and that we're giving opportunities to connect with communities um, and experts, and we're practicing good digital citizenship. And again, that really nuts and bolts best practice, that the rubrics are available, learning objectives are clear, and that we support and extend their learning. Um, so this was an important part. Set you down your non-negotiables for your staff. Tell them what the, the must-dos are. And so this led to some expectations around about how they were going to set up the Google Classroom as a home base, about how they were going to publish learning objectives and rubrics from day one. Um, I will share all these resources with you through the Q&A so I can give you links to the um, actual documents. Um, and then also using making sure we're setting deadlines for assignments and making learning from the class really visible. And then when we were designing our learning, we were thinking about how we were doing that in a way that was going to be um, reflecting what we know to be 
um, best practice. And as you can see, the quotes on the right are the student voice that informed um, those expectations. So universal design for learning. I am just going to scoot across the surface of universal design for learning. There's um, incredible websites. Just Google universal design for learning. Go and look at the cast.org website. I encourage you to dive deep into universal design for learning. I think every teacher um, should understand the principles of universal design for learning and this idea that we must ensure students can access information through multiple modes. You know, if you're working in an online environment, by goodness, you must be making sure you're offering blogs, videos, infographics, and podcasts. Don't be just dumping worksheets into those spaces and having written resources. Ensure students have choice to record how they're learning. If they want to do voice recordings, why not let them? If they want to do graphics and drawings, let them do that as well. And again, give them um, a choice through multiple modes of how they can evidence their learning as well. So here's some examples of how I've done it. It's really basic. This is not um, sort of, you know, brain, what do you, I can't even, I've lost my words. But, this, you know, this is not complex. This is just best practice. So making sure that you're giving your students consciously thinking about the modes you are presenting to them. Do not just be giving them those PDFs and those handouts. Make sure every single time you are offering up you know, yes, do some written um, notes, but make sure there's video. Make sure you're using visually and um, information graphics. If you can find podcasts on the topic, make sure those are available for students as well. And then make sure when they're given the opportunity to evidence their learning and to be assessed, that unless there is a bloody good reason, you are giving them choice about which mode they can present their learning. Now, I'm an English teacher, and we can be the worst. We can get students writing essays until the cows come home. Um, but the reality is, we live in the 21st century. These people need to engage with complex communication skills. They need to be able to produce a... Um, podcasts, they need to be able to produce videos, infographics, all of those things. So if you are assessing the understanding of a concept or a skill, let them choose the way and the mode by which they evidence that learning. Do not default to what is easy. Do not default to the mode that you prefer. And I think that's one of the biggest traps we can fall into. You know, we are educators. We succeeded in this thing called school, and that's why we're here. Um, and we've got to make sure we're not just designing learning that we like ourselves and prefer. And so some really neat quotes came through when I did a study with my students about how they found this. They absolutely loved it. And they loved the fact that they had ownership and they had choice and they felt like they could work in a way that allowed them to succeed. And by goodness, if there's one thing I'm here for, it's to help my young people um, to succeed. And then making learning visible. This is an easy, quick one. We started um, afresh, so we had an opportunity to create a lang learning language of our own. We call it the HPSS Learning Design Model. Um, Di Cavallo, the Deputy Principal, and her fantastic team of learning design leaders did an incredible amount of work exploring the New Zealand curriculum and pulling out um, the sort of the action verb. So in a sense, this is our design thinking um, model that we use at the school. And what we've found is having a common language of learning highlights the metacognition that we're focusing on and the stages of metacognition that we're focusing on. So for example, when we design modules, we use common learning design model informed learning objectives. So for instance, in Health and PE, they were using the learning objective to explore by investing investigating identity in sport and physical activity. So it's highlighting the med metacognitive stage and skill that they're focusing on. Um, and it's also making really explicit what it is they're going to be learning um, in that module at that point in time. Another example, to test by applying knowledge of um, peel paragraphs to paragraph writing, to test by applying knowledge of, and then you had your different examples and context for the subjects. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to demystify and highlight the cognitive skills that our young people were focusing on. And as a result, our students can really clearly articulate um, not only the content that they're learning, but um, also the skills they're developing as well. So it's really easy. I just make sure absolutely every day 
for every lesson, I start up my um, Google Classroom announcement with the learning ob objective. So this term we've been focusing on to generate by producing a portfolio of texts for different purposes and audience. And this instance um, happened to be a, a podcast that they were um, producing for the module. And again, the students love this. We um, had really good feedback. They feel like it's um, really clear um, what it is that they're learning and what skill that they're focusing on. And they actually transfer those skills a bit more because they hear the same um, sort of verbs um, being used across different learning areas and different modules. And that we've started to build a bit of a toolkit of strategy, common strategies we use to um, support each part of that learning design model. So really, this all comes back to this. Um, you know, if we're gonna use technology and tools, it's about actually freeing up our students and freeing up um, the, their op opportunities to become what I call free range learners. You know, we uh, should all be sitting in the equivalent of sort of, you know, free range farm schools with organic products. Um, we want our students to have a sense of choice and ownership um, we want them to be able to have choice of resources and topics. We want them to have choice about how they record their learning, how they can evidence their learning. And we want options um, for self-directed learning, options that guide personal goal setting and expectations, and options that scaffold coping skills and strategies and develop um, more and more strategies around self-assessment and peer assessment and um, self-reflection. And actually, you do this by giving your young people time. So. I use Google Classroom because I can put all of that information up front. Uh, for anything, I do five to 10 minutes direct teaching at the beginning of an 80 minute module. And the rest of the time, they're getting on with it. And I'm out there amongst them. And if actually there's one challenge I can lay down at the end of this presentation, is the idea that I think all of you should get rid of your teacher desks. There's one thing that we don't have around here at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. We have open shared spaces with big shared tables, and there is nearly a teacher's desk in the whole school. So you're up there, you're presenting um, your sort of direct teaching, um, direct instruction at the beginning of the block, but actually after that, do not go sit your ass in the corner. Get out amongst your students, sit amongst them, and. Um, you know, make sure that you're using the technology to give the students time to get on with the work and to find their own way through the work. And then you're freed up for some face-to-face, one-on-one time and supporting them as needed. But actually, just get up and get out of the way and give them time to do um, their learning. So I've... Um, spoken enough and I've spoken fast I know and I will make sure that I do share that um, e-learning pr best practice guide I'll put a link into it into the Q&A's um, someone asked how we impact um, monitor the impact of the teaching strategies I'm just going to go off the slide and um, then Chris can also jump in yeah Claire, so, as well. so, so there are a ton of questions and Claire is going to engage with them afterwards um, in, in writing so she will be able to answer some of those. I, the biggest question which has come up with the most votes, which you have two minutes to answer, would be yeah. how have you overcome the challenges of timetabling thematic modules? Okay, so that has been a huge challenge for us and we're, we've got the advantage of being relative, we've got 350 students at the moment, so there are already challenges. Do you know how we do it? We do it through a series of post-it notes on a wall. So what we have done is um, we've worked out our you know, teacher to student ratio. So you've got, say, 150 um, students. You want approximately um, sort of 25 students in a class. So that number of teachers and that number of students are put into an option line. And, you know, as you would in any school, and then actually those teachers, before the semester starts, they all get together and they negotiate who is going to teach with whom and who can see some natural connections between their subjects based under an overarching context for a term. So for instance, our term one um, focus was identity. Um, say there was eight teachers in the group um, they all talked to each other, they negotiated who could pair up with each other. So in a sense, the timetable is no different. It's just that we could actually group 50 students with two teachers rather than um, putting one 
you know, one teacher with the 25 students. So we do have the advantage of space. I think people need, really need to challenge physical spaces in schools because our open learning plan does allow 50 students to work with two teachers. So in a sense, the timetable is no different. You're just, you're just partnering up with someone in your option line. Awesome answer. Thank you so much, Claire, for a highly challenging, incredibly interesting presentation this morning. The number of questions that have come through are, are phenomenal. So Claire is going to spend a little bit of time answering those. Um, we're going to finish up now. But just once again, on behalf of everyone who's been able to watch this, Claire, fabulous. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.